Hi guys, on with the next part of aircraft flight mechanics now. I just need to um, make a quick correction here. So these are our linearized equations of motion. This top one, I got rid of the wrong trig term. This is the term we should have ended up with at the previous lecture. It was correct in the notes. Um, I just made a mistake whilst I was doing my algebra. Um, so we've got our translational equations of motion. We've got U, V and W motions. We've got our rotational equations of motion. So we've got roll, pitch and your motions. And then we've got our time rate of change of the Euler angles into the body rates. Now these are all the linear expressions we need. So these top three translational, and these are the rotational equations of motion. And we're gonna use these to help us um, manipulate these further into so-called concise form. Let's just remember where things come from in here. So the left-hand side of this, this comes from, originally it was a an expression which was M, open bracket, and then it was U dot, and then we had two cross-coupling terms. So we had QW minus RV. And when we linearized, we found that those were much smaller because it was they were the product terms are smaller and because the, the trim values of Q and of V were both zero, we could get rid of them. And then again, this was MG, um, MG sine theta. So we're able to use this to expand and get rid of all of those other terms for the aircraft equations of motion. So what we need to do now is work out some linear expressions for these parts. So X, Y, and Z, and L, M, and N, which are our forces and our moments. So we need to determine something we can use that again has a linear expression for these. Um, and that's going to help us determine these equations fully in a linear format. So we're going to do it in a sort of generalized method and we're going to end up showing and we're going to end up coming up with a formulation for all of these that involves a lot of stability derivatives which are things we've sort of looked at already so we're going to try and develop a, well we're not going to try we are going to develop a means that helps us look at all of these wow it's a hell of a lag on my screen today i'm gonna Ah, uh, that's fine. That's good enough for us. Okay. That's lagging a lot, but I will work around it. I'll just stop looking at my screen as it's coming up. Okay, so we're going to assume that the external forces and moments are functions of both of the instantaneous values of all of those disturbance velocities, u, v, and w, um, and the p, q, and r, because those are rotational velocities, and the control angles, and then the derivatives of all of those things. So we're going to assume that X, Y, Z, L, M, and N are a function of all of these things, function of the disturbance velocities and the time rate of change of each of these, and then 
each of the control angles and the time rate of change of those. So we can write that out. We're going to say x is equal to some function, which we don't, we don't know what that function is. Some function of u. Delta r and delta r dots. Okay, so that's for one of our expressions. We've got six of these, so I'm just going to copy this bit out six times. Okay, so we've got these big, dirty, great expressions, effectively saying that each of our six parts here is the function of, well, we've got u, v, w, p, q, and r, and then we've got three control settings and then derivatives of each of those. So each of these is a function of 18 different things, okay? So we're going to use a generalized approach where we can look at the effect of this without actually really defining what these functions are just yet. So we're going to just say about these, f1 through f6 could be defined. And in fact, I might include some simple cases for this, just as an added extra. I used to do it in the old course. We compare some simple nonlinear models with the linearized expressions. So we could do this, um, but in general, we're going to use this because we want this generalized format of how these equations can work. So we're going to use this and we're going to represent what these functions, or we're going to represent what the value of these functions away from trim are using Taylor series. Or I should say we'll use a Taylor series approximation. Taylor series or Taylor series is I'm not certain what was the correct grammar there. Those are one of those or Taylor series is probably one of those things that you might sort of know that you should know as undergraduates, but maybe sort of forget. So let's just do a quick revision of what Taylor series is. If I've got some function, So we're just going to call it f, which is a function of x. And we know that we can have, it's continuously differentiable, or we have a bunch of different derivatives in some interval. So this just means it's a continuous function having derivatives of all orders in an interval. So we want to know the value of f of x where x is less than a plus some delta, some small perturbation, uh, and greater than value of a plus some small perturbation. So this is then around this point a. So our sort of aircraft analog of this is the point a is our subscript zero. This is our trim or equilibrium case and then the derivatives of all orders we're going to show that actually these end up being our stability derivatives and we're 
we're going to show you more about those as we develop this. But we can say that if we want to know the value of f plus h, for example, so if f of x plus h, where h is some quantity that's smaller than delta in this case, So within the quantity that we've got these derivatives defined at, then we can get, we can represent this as, let's just bring it down actually. The value of the function at the trim point plus then the infinite sum of the derivatives multiplied by whatever h is, which is the different distance that we need to go. So we've got the first derivative of our function multiplied by that distance h, which is the distance we want to know away by, plus h squared on 2 factorial multiplied by the second derivative, plus h cubed on 3 factorial multiplied by the third derivative. And we don't just stop there. We continue going all the way to infinity. So that's our Taylor series approximation, and that's sort of what we, we know. We can then use this to work out our perturbations of the external forces and moments. So in the Taylor series example that we just, or the, the generalized Taylor series, that was just something that we, a f was just a function of x. We've got now x, y, z, l, m, and m, and each of those is a function of 18 different things. So we can just add up the contributions of each of those. And we'll say, for example, then the, the effectively where we had f of x plus h, this is then for our purposes, our trim value, plus delta x in this case is going to be equal to f of a, which would be x naught, plus then I'm, I need to do this 18 times through. So I might write this down and fast forward this. So I'm going to do the derivatives with respect to u, dx on du, multiplied by u, again all the way on to infinity and then got to do the same for with u dot See if I can copy this out a few times and just change some letters. In fact, I'm never going to write all of these down. So let's just change these. In fact, let's just rub this whole one out. This will be continued again all the way down, remembering that I'd be changing each of those derivatives. So I've gone through u and u dots. I have to have v, v dots, w, w dots. I'm gonna have to pause this to answer the phone. Sorry, guys. Right, sorry for the interruption there. That was the Dean of Students telling me that I can, I can host a stupid quiz night for you guys. So going down here, we would need to have v 
um, v dots, w, w dots, and then the same with p, q, r, and then the same with all of these control rates as well. So it'd be delta a, delta a dots, delta e, delta e dots, and delta r, delta r dots. So this last one down here should be my control derivatives. I'm just going to write that out in full actually. So we would have plus dx on d delta r dot multiplied by delta r delta subscript r dot plus dx on d delta r dot squared. That's d2x, sorry. Multiplied by delta r dot squared on two factorial. And I'm not even going to write the third one out. I'm just going to say that these all continue to infinity in this case. So we would have to do this for each one of the force and moment perturbations, but we can see immediately that a couple of things are going to cancel, which is pretty useful. So our trim part just cancels on each side. And actually, we end up, or we can end up showing if we were to come up with a full aerodynamic model, that all of these extra derivatives are actually neg negligible. So second and higher order derivatives are negligible. So we can then write these out, um, say, for example, for the x now. Let's just write out for the x1. Shouldn't be a dot over that V, sorry. So now we've still got, um, we're gonna have six of these expressions, one for delta X, one for delta Y, one for delta Z, L, M, and N. So we're gonna have six rows like this. And we can see in each of these, we're going to have 18 terms. So it's 18 terms because we've got U, V, W, P, Q, R, delta E, delta A, delta R, and then the first derivatives of each of these. And we actually are going to, what we should really do here, let's just think about the significance of these. I don't always include this when I write it out by hand, but I do include it in the notes. When we write down these here, let's have a think about the actual physical significance of this derivative. So these are the aerodynamic. Or stability derivatives. And these denote the response of the aircraft to whatever we're looking at. So this would be the response in X force, so longitudinal force due to a U, which is the lowercase U is the forward speed perturbation. And when we're writing them out, we should really put a pipe and a zero there. Let's just talk about what this means. So this is longitudinal force now what we mean by this pipe is that this derivative is only valid around the trim state for which we've evaluated it at
So you'll end up seeing these stability derivatives that have been put in different, um, say different uh, sets of data for different aircraft. And then they'll be denoted, i.e. the aircraft is in cruise, power approach, landing. And it'll, that's when those derivatives are valid for. Um, I'm going to pause again and just try and get rid of the delay on the screen because it's bugging the hell out of me. Okay, now I'm back. Not delayed, which is good. Um, so let's just think about these derivatives as well. So this example up here, like we say, this is the rate of change of longitudinal force with a forward with a forward speed perturbation. So this one, these are all these are all dimensional. So this one would have the units of newtons per meters per second. Okay, or it would be newton per meter second or newton seconds per meter, whatever this, these units are here. But this is only going to be valid at the point at which we've actually got some data for them. Um, say this one here, this would have different units. This would be newtons per meters per second squared because we've got this with response to an acceleration. And then these would be uh, newtons, it might be say in degrees per second squared because they're in degrees per second because this is a, a rate of a control application here. And just one last note to make, sometimes you'll see these ones called control derivatives. Right, anything with, with, that's got a control deflection or a control rate, sometimes you'll be see those called the control derivatives. And what, I'm aware that this lag is back, but I'm not going to bother going through with it. I'm not going to bother sorting it out, rather. So this pipe here, you'll see that I include it in the notes um, because it's useful to, to just remind you guys that those, those, this, this number we have here is only valid for this state that we've got it evaluated at. Um, I'm going to drop it in the writing it by hand because it's just a real pain to continue writing out. So let's just think about how many of these we've got. So we've got six aircraft states and 18 derivatives. And this is just the sort of the minimum that we've got at the moment. So we've got these because we said it's going to be a function of U, V, W, P, Q, and R, L, and M. So we've got U dot as well, V dot, and then the, the, again, the same first time derivative of all of these. We could have included the um, second derivative of those as well. Um, we could include other control reflections. We could include, um, say, if we've got other control surfaces on the aircraft, for example, we could also include more of those. We could include thrust in these as well, often is included in some of them. But at the moment we're going to um, we're going to just work with them as we've got. And let's just think that we've got six times 18, which gives us 108. So this is going to lead to a whole horrible set of equations to deal with. So we're going to see if we can get rid of some somehow, and if we can if we can manipulate our equations to help us remove some of them. So, so we don't want to work with that many. So we end up saying, let's think about different means that we can get rid of them. We're going to invoke some assumptions about flights and we're going to see, and then we're going to propagate those assumptions through into our equations of motion. So we're going to say cross coupling is negligible compared to any any sort of direct terms in these in these equations. So we'll say that 
any symmetric variable My mic fell over there, sorry guys. So any symmetric variable, so we've got u, w, q, and then we've got the symmetric controls as well. So we've got delta e, well the only one is delta e. So let's just write these down. u, u dot w, w dot q, q dot delta e and delta e dot. So we said that any symmetric variable does not affect asymmetric forces and moments. So our asymmetric forces and moments are going to be the side force, so Y going to be the yawing and the rolling moment. So it's going to be um, L and N. So it follows that from this, the derivatives of these with respect to these are all going to be zero. So that gives us one, two, three times one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So we've got three times eight. So we've got 24 things we can get rid of. So I'll start to write these out. I'm not going to write out all of them, but we'll just say, for example, dy by du is equal to dy on du dot all the way through to all of those variables, all the way through to dn on d delta e dot. Those are all going to be zero. Like we say, we've got 24 of those in total that we can get rid of. So it also follows that if this is true, then the opposite is going to be true as well. So the derivatives of the symmetric forces and moments with respect to the asymmetric variables are also going to be negligible. So our symmetric variables are v, v dot p, p dot r, r dot delta a, delta a dot delta r, and delta r dot. So it follows we've actually got slightly more things to get rid of here now. I'm just looking at my notes, seeing if I've got this in here correctly. Yeah, I do. So 
then our asymmetric forces and moments are going to be the ones that, um, sorry, this should be, I've written that wrongly. These are the asymmetric variables don't affect the symmetric forces and moments. So the symmetric forces and moments are going to be X and Z, and then it's going to be the pitching moment. So it's going to be M. So it follows that for these dx by dv, so dx on dv dot is equal to all the way up to dm on d delta r dot. Those are all equal to zero. So we've got for slightly more, we've got two, four, six, eight, yeah, we've got 10 times three, so we've got 30 derivatives to get rid of here. So I haven't written them all out here, but they are included on the notes just because it's cumbersome to write all of these out. So we can get rid of a whole bunch of derivatives here, which is pretty useful. So we've got rid of a total of 54 derivatives just by assuming that cross coupling is negligible. We can separate out this symmetric flight. And um, let's give these a new name. Let's call this symmetric um, aka the longitudinal and we'll say the asymmetric aka lateral directional and we're going to use those terms a little bit more later when we actually derive things in full so I've got rid of 54 here. I'm gonna go through and use some other assumptions to get rid of some more, but we can't just keep adding numbers to 54 because some of the other things we get rid of are included in here as well. So we're gonna show, and it's been found through experiment and through doing sort of things like wind tunnel testing and flight testing, that any derivative with respect to an acceleration is negligible except for the rate of change of pitching moment with vertical acceleration. rate of change of dm on dw dot. That's the only one that we can't get rid of. So anything with a dot on the on the um, underside, so u, v, w, p, q, and r, we can get rid of all of those. just check one thing again because I've rewritten my notes recently and I want to check I'm actually uh, in key with what I've done before because a lot of these remembering which derivatives you can get rid of is um, I'm I can never remember which ones you can get rid of which ones you can't I can remember the ones like the symmetric and the asymmetric but there's certain here that you we end up just showing that you you can get rid of um, just because we found through experiment that they're not correct. And I wanted to check if I've got the right ones before I show you guys. There we go, that's fine. Okay, I just want to check that I got one of these right whilst I'm going through it. Um, 
so we can get rid of all of these again we can get rid of a whole bunch of things we've we know that we've got u dot v dot w dot p dot q dot and r not dot so any derivative with respect to these except for this one we can get rid of so we've got six times six so we've got 36 minus one 35 extras that we can get rid of but some of these are all already included in the one we've got above So if you've got time and you want to go through and see which ones we that are included in the above, I'm happy for you to do that. I'm not going to bother with that. We also know that it doesn't matter how quickly you apply a control surface. So we could, we could almost treat a control, a, a control surface as being one of these. Um, sorry, a control surface speed of application as being acceleration, but we'll say it separately. So it's... doesn't matter how quickly so then that means that d on d delta e so d on d delta e dots so anything on these is equal to d so these are all equal to zero so we've got six times three 18 further derivatives we can get rid of here and these are the ones that i was just looking up to check there's a bunch of other derivatives we can get rid of and this one's just been found through experiments. So let's think about what they mean. following derivatives is neg negligible. So dx on dq is the rate of change of longitudinal force with a perturbation in pitching moment. Also negligible is dx on d delta e. So that's the rate of change of longitudinal force with elevator application. Also the rate of change of side force with roll rate. Rate of change of side force. Let's make it clear that these are Y's here. With your rate and the rate of change of side force with aileron application. Those are all zero. So putting this all together, so we've got these dirty great expressions with third well we got rid of all of those terms here and I then wrote out this one here so we've got 18 terms times 6 gives us 108 derivatives if we take these 108 and we get rid of all of these bits that we just got rid of we end up with the force and moment perturbations but with reduced derivatives So, and this is just where I had to copy these down. So delta x is equal to dx. Let's make that very clear, that's an x and not a y. dx on du. Evaluate, and again, I'm gonna return the pipes now because it's easy when I'm writing these out to return the pipes. That's dx.
So we're going to go through these and just check that they make sense to us once we get once we've written them all down. That's dz by du. Sorry guys, it's a pain to keep my microphone out of the way. Just noticed some mistake in the notes and it will be corrected by the time you copy that down. This was listed as being elevator here. I know it's not elevator because this is rolling moment. The last term has to be aileron in here, okay? So it can include the rudder, can include the aileron, can't include the elevator, okay? There's that only acceleration term we include, which is the effect of heave acceleration on pitching moments. We can now go through this and just check that everything in here makes sense. So longitudinal force is going to be largely a function of here. Really, it's U and V. So we've got forward speed and vertical velocity. And it makes sense that it's a function of those two. No control derivatives affect the longitudinal um, perturbational force. Here for, for side force, we've got the rudder is the only, the only control surface that can actually produce side force directly here, which makes sense. And then this is going to be a function of effectively side slip, which is V here. Z, so effectively lift. Again, it can be a function of U and W, and then a function of the elevator deflection, which makes sense. Okay, and then moments, so L, rolling moments. Okay, it can be two controls can produce this, rudder and aileron, which which um, makes sense. So yeah, rudder and aileron, so we've got the ailerons on the wings, rudder can produce a rolling moment as well. And then it's going to be a function of side slip. It's going to be a function of roll rate and yaw rate. And we know that there's a coupling between roll and yaw rate. Those are both lateral directional motions. And so we wouldn't expect there to be a pitch rate in here. And consequently, there isn't. M, function of forward speed. So M is pitching moment. It's the only one that's got an acceleration term in there. Function of pitch rate, heave velocity, heave speed, and then elevator deflection. Remember, elevator produces a moment. So we've got that in here correctly. Yaw rate. 
sorry, your um, yawing moments is going to be a function of side slip, which makes sense because that's pr because of the rudder and because it's a, it's a longitudinal motion. Um, it's going to be a function of roll rate and your rate, remembering that these are coupling. So if if rolling moment is a function of P and R, it follows that yawing moment is also going to be a function of P and R here. It's just a different derivative. And then again, the two control surfaces for the lateral directional modes can be included here in these terms. So we've got to these derivatives here. What we can now do is we can take these, remember, let's just go back and try and remember where, why we've done this. So did I start all the way back here? Yeah, I did start all the way back here. Everything we've just done was to create these terms in yellow. So now we can take them and we can substitute them into our these equations of motion and I can write them out. So I'm going to write them out again. Oh, that's going to be fun. In fact, I can copy and paste a lot of this. So I'm going to copy and paste a lot of these and I'm going to write some equations out in red and some equations out in green. So the x equation mu dot is equal to uh, let's write it out. No, I'm going to copy and paste this bit. So it's equal to the force perturbation, which is what we've got here. Minus mg cosine theta trim multiplied by the trim perturbation here. Then I've got mv dot is going to be equal to delta y, which is the bit that I just had. I'm missing a control term on this one on the note, so let's just copy, let's write that down. So I'm moving all the control terms to the right hand side of these equations now. Then writing down the z one. So I'm going to have m w dot is equal to those two force derivatives. These are equal to my delta z. So dz on du plus dz on dw. And I'm going to, again, I'm going to put this delta e, which was my elevated deflection, I'll put this at the end of this term here. So I'm going to have plus m u dot sorry, u naught q minus mg sine theta trim multiplied by theta dot and then I've got this control term in here plus dz on d delta e delta E. Okay, so three down, three to go. Now these are my, again, these are all translational equations of motion, but I've got two that correspond to symmetric flight and one that corresponds to asymmetric flight. Let's turn this into red as well, because I'm going to write all of these in. Okay, let's write this down. So the next one is going to be, well, I've got the left-hand side of the rotational equations of motion, which is I x x p dot minus I x z multiplied by R dot. And then I've got these terms here to include. So I've got four dirty great derivatives in here. Actually, there's five derivatives to put in here, so let's just write them all down.
Okay, so that's the equation of motion for rolling moments. Now again, we've got pitching moments, so that's going to be a, a symmetric variable. So I have I, Y, Y, Q, or I, Y, Y, Q dot rather, is going to be equal to these terms here. Almost there, we've got one last equation to write down. So we've got rolling and pitching motion now. And again, these are all on the, on the accompanying notes. I'll make, in the accompanying notes, there was, um, this term wasn't included, but I'll correct that by the time you get into it. And then I'm going to include the last one on here now. So this is for Ewing motion, I, Z, Z, R dot minus I, X, Z, P dot. And then I've got these derivatives to include now. Okay, so these equations that we've got, these are the dimensional linear equations of motion in increasing size, because I'm bad at writing. So let's see if I can make this bigger. Uh, not easily. So uh, you should have a copy of these as you're going along anyway, and I'm gonna trust you to have written them at a suitable size. They're also included in the accompanying notes. So let's just highlight these. And like I say, I've separated them down into symmetric and asymmetric. So we've got these ones here are the symmetric. So what we mean by symmetric is that we've got the symmetric, uh, we've got U, W, Q. Those are the forward speed, the vertical velocity and the, and the pitch perturbations are gonna be a function of the theta and delta E. And then we've got the asymmetric. So the fact that we've got these equations sort of separated down into a symmetric and asymmetric might seem like a, a lovely thing that's fallen out of the physics. Um, it's not actually a, a function of the physics. It's the fact that we sort of said this is how they're going to be. We're going to make the assumption that the symmetric variables don't affect the asymmetric 
uh, states and the asymmetric variables don't affect the symmetric states. So because of that, we've got these two sets of equations now that we've called the symmetric and the asymmetric. Remember, the symmetric is longitudinal and the asymmetric is lateral directional. So we've got these equations in motion now, um, and we're going to spend a bit of time just doing what's called turning them into concise form. So at the moment, they're a bit sort of unwieldy. We've still got these, this, these aren't very nice to write out, dn by dv pipe zero, not very nice to write out. So we're gonna write them out in so-called concise form. Um, so we're gonna, we're gonna normalize these variables by either the mass or the moment of inertia, depending on what we're, which plane of motion we're looking at or what sort of what sort of derivative it is. And that's gonna help us represent the most normalized derivatives. So they're still going to be um, dimensional derivatives, but we're just gonna normalize them with respect to either a mass or a moment of inertia here. So we'll move on to that next. I'm gonna leave this where we are now. I need to edit this video and put all those bits together and fast forward through some of it. I hope you guys are all still with me on this. Um, again, I know I've been sort of sloppy with some of my handwriting while I go through, but it's because I'm hoping you're copying along. I, you know, if you're uncertain whether this is an A or an E, I don't want to see you asking that on the Slack space because you should be able to think about it. This is a an equation of motion that we know now is in the asymmetric plane. Therefore, it has to have it. It has to have two controls and that's gonna be the aileron and the rudder. Okay, so I want you to think about this stuff and be able to intuit some, and it's why, you know, it's not why I've been sloppy with my handwriting, but it's why I've not been deliberately making sure that whether this is an R or an A or an E in each case is perfect. Because again, you guys know, and you're probably sick of me saying it, I want you guys to understand this stuff. Okay, I want you to think about it and to understand these equations rather than just being able to answer exam questions. So, that's it from me for today. I'm going to record the next part of this probably a little bit later, um, but I'll release them a little bit slowly because we're actually sort of ahead of schedule now. So hopefully we'll have more time to go into control systems for aircraft. That'll be good fun. I best write that module. Okay, have a good weekend, guys. I'll see you all in the next lecture. Take care.